My name is Charles Malky, biologist and plant expert with Ivy Organics. I graduated cum laude from the University of California, Irvine in 1998 and have over 20 years of successful growing, planting, caring, and even teaching communities across the country on how to care for your plants. In this video, I will share the importance of Ivy Organics 3-in-1 Tree Guard Paint and how this product can be used to protect your fruit trees, your ornamental trees, your roses and shrubs. Every home gardener and orchard grower should be applying this product to protect their trees from the elements. The first defense of Ivy Organic Tree Guard Paint is to provide a shield against the sun's harmful rays that cause sunburn during the hottest summer days, as well as sun scald, which is caused when the temperature abruptly rises too high during the cold winter months. Both sunburn and sun scald cause the tree's bark to crack and or die, resulting in additional stress which gets compounded by insects and parasites that enter the barkless wood, an invasion that will ultimately shorten the tree's life. The white paint reflects the most amount of light and provides the greatest protection. However, if requested, Ivy Organic provides custom natural looking colors as well. The second defense of Ivy Organics Tree Guard Paint is to provide a shield against beetles, termites, and other wood boring insects. This product contains a variety of natural oils including peppermint oil, clove oil, garlic oil, cinnamon oil, cedarwood oil, and rosemary oil, all of which are plant derived proven oils for creating a natural insect repellent when applied to your prized trees. Many of these oils have a dual insect and antifungal benefit to your plants that when applied to your plants suppress parasitic fungi that can otherwise poison and kill plant tissues and steal the plant nutrients. The third defense of Ivy Organic Tree Guard Paint is to provide a shield against rodents such as rats, moles, voles, gophers, and yes, cute bunnies too, that may gnaw on your tree's bark. This product contains castor oil which comes from the castor tree seed and naturally makes everything coated with this product tastes horrible. This product when applied to your prized trees should repel most rodents from taking a bite after its first lick. Ivy Organics 3-in-1 Tree Guard Paint provides a natural defense to sunburn, insects, and rodents. Visit ivyorganics.com for more informative videos and a list of our retailers that supply our organic products. Hi, my name is Charles Malky, biologist and plant expert with Ivory Organics, where we grow cool plants. And this week is the week that Ivory Organics is launching, launching its super and premium blend organic fertilizers. What makes the Ivory Organics super and premium blend fertilizers better than any other product on the market? I've got my list here. I'm just going to read off of it. I'm going to put it down on the screen as well to share with you to kind of give you a heads up to the live launch day of. June 16th, which is Saturday, June 16th, 2018, at 8.05 a.m. We're going to be announcing and sharing a lot of what the benefits of the product are. We're going to share the product with you, and we're also going to give 20 free bags to the first contestants to accomplish a very simple task, which will be announced shortly after 8.05 a.m. on again at June 16th, 2018. We're here right now at the Americana in Glendale and there is a box store just around the corner we're going to walk to. I want to share with you with some of the typical products you can expect on your on most garden shelves throughout the country. So let's check that out. So a lot of you ask this question, what's the difference between organic versus chemical fertilizers? Does it truly matter? Um, the first thing I want to share with you is there's some cities across the country that are banning the use of chemical fertilizers, especially when it's too close to a lake or, or a body of water. Bear in mind, and there's a lot of research that substantiates this, that as much as 60 to 80 percent of chemical fertilizers end up running, leaching through the soil and end up in your gutters, your drains, lakes, streams, and ultimately the ocean. So imagine for every pound of fertilizer, 
about a half a pound to three quarters of that pound of fertilizer is leaching. It's not even doing anything in your garden. So consider the amount of waste that's happening. Secondly, using chemical fertilizers increases the salinity in the soil. Nobody wants salty soil that is damaging to most plants. And lastly, using chemical fertilizers, not only does it not support the soil health biology, but it actually harms it. There's a lot of research to show that chemical fertilizers will harm the beneficial bacteria, the beneficial fungus that's in your soil, as well as all of the other supporting life that's within your soil. On the contrary, using an organic fertilizer, what you're gonna do is end up feeding the soil beneficial bacteria. You're gonna be feeding the beneficial mycorrhizal fungi. You're gonna be feeding the earthworms within the soil and ultimately supporting all of the soil life. And by having more soil life, you're gonna end up having more organisms that are gonna be returning more essential elements into the soil for maximum plant health. Let's get and check out the nearest box store so we can see a garden shelf so we can now start comparing these two products. Check this out. So here we are now. I've identified two companies that um, are offering chemical solutions for fertilizing your plants and then there's two organic options for fertilizing your plants. The first one over here, let's take a look. If you take a look here on the back, you can see that the um, as a chemical fertilizer, it's derived from ammonium sulfate, potassium phosphate, potassium chloride, urea, urea phosphate, boric acid, copper sulfate, iron EDTA, magnesium, and so forth. Also, something else I want to pull you out to is the macronutrients to make sure that they're all there: nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and then these are some micro elements: boron, copper, iron manganese, molybdenum, and zinc. I see that it's missing right off the bat. There's no mention of calcium, no mention of magnesium. I see manganese, no magnesium, which is another macronutrient. I don't see any sulfur. Um, so those are three macronutrients, the nutrients that plants need in abundance that's not in this product. Um, and then if we take a look over here, here's another chemical option. And if you take a look at the derived from down here. Polymer coated, again, chemical formulations, ammonium nitrate, ammonium phosphate, potassium sulfate, magnesium sulfate. I don't need to keep on reading, but these are all chemically derived ways to get to nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, the NPKs. And then here's magnesium and sulfur, boron, copper, iron, manganese, molybdenum, and zinc. So there's a you know quite a few micronutrients but what's missing on this list calcium the and we're going to be learning as you continue watching these ivory organics um educational moment that calcium and i'm going to share with you the university studies that substantiate that that's the number two most important macronutrients for plants which are also lacking in this product as well if we take a look here now um at an organic option and this one here is a, a, a five 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 if we take a look here on the side, it's going to show you that it is derived from hydrolyzed feather meal, blood meal, bone meal, sulfate of potash and compost with 5% nitrogen, 5% phosphate or your phosphorus, and 5% soluble potash. So 555 for your NPK. Again, your NPK. But again, what happened to your calcium? your magnesium, and your sulfur. Three macronutrients that are missing. If we take a look at the, um, again, this is the same company. We can go up here. Here's another product. And again, I see that there's tomatoes on here. And for those of you that grow tomatoes, you know the importance of making sure that you've got an organic fertilizer that has calcium to prevent and blossom rot. That's where the bottom of the tomato will start turning black. So if we take a look here at, the, um, at this particular product, if we turn it over, it's gonna show Nitrogen, 2%, phosphorus, 7%, potassium, 4%, so that's your NPK, derived from feather meal, bone meal, sulfate of potash. But what happened to the other three macronutrients? Not mentioned. And again, here's another product made by the same company as well. Um, so there we just looked at two chemical fertilizers, two organic fertilizers. None of them offer plants all six macronutrients. And this was another interesting thing I want to share with you as well. If you take a look here, take a look at what percent 
of NPK is in here. So this is, we're looking at um, nitrogen, 0 0.02, phosphorus, 0 0.02, and potash, 0 0.02. If you take a look at the NPK numbers, I'm hoping you can really zoom in here and capture this. It's 0 0.02, 0 0.02, 0 0.02, meaning that less than 1% of this entire product has any beneficial fertilizer for your plant. It's 99% water, 1% fertilizer compared to a product like this that's got 5%, 5%, 5%. And we're gonna learn more about percentages. So at least you got 15% of the bag contents going towards NPK. This one over here, a 5.46. So 5% nitrogen, 4% phosphorus, and 6% potassium. So that would be um, you're getting more value and getting higher numbers. We're gonna be talking about liquid feeds as the Ivory Organics Super and Premium Blend fertilizers can be used both as a ground fertilizer as well as a nutritional foliar spray um, fertilizer as well. So we're gonna discuss all of that um, in the upcoming video. So I hope you found this informative. One last thing I wanna share with you before we get out of here. Um, let's take a look at, again, the backside of this product. We just read that the, it's derived from feather meal, bone meal, sulfate of potash. I hope you guys see the difference between the derived from on this organic product versus the chemical alternatives, which are derived from, let's put them side by side here. Uh, so if you take a look again, it's derived from, this is ammonium sulfate, potassium false, um, phosphate, potassium chloride. It sounds like you're in a chemistry lab, right? You, you, I'm hoping you, you see the difference versus feather meal, which are obviously composted down feathers, that's the meal, the bone meal is composted down bones. Um, and then sulfate of potash is just a mineral source. Um, so I hope you guys also um, can quickly learn to pick up your product, read the back of it, see where it's derived from, and know without even reading the fact that it says organic on the label, to know that it's an organic derived source because of the ingredients that are within it. So that's another educational point lesson I wanna share with you all. So I hope you found all of this informative and we're gonna recap just outside of here. So let's get out. So now you've got a little bit of an introduction to the background of what the Ivory Organics Super and Premium Blend Fertilizers are gonna be all about. Um, so be sure not to miss out on the live YouTube event on this Saturday, June 16, 2018, starting at 8.05 a.m. And 20 of you will have the opportunity and the contest rules will be announced shortly after 8.05 a.m. for an opportunity to win up to 20 free bags, complimentary bags, shipping included throughout the United States to those contestants that participate um, in that contest, again, with the rules being announced shortly after 8.05 a.m. Looking forward to seeing you all there on the YouTube Live launch event. So just a reminder, when you hit that subscribe button down below, to also make sure you hit that bell push notification, which will let you know and remind you of the fact that we're going live on that Saturday morning. I hope you find all of these videos informative and educational. And if so, again, don't forget to give us that thumbs up. And we're hoping to be your partner in making this your best growing season ever. Thanks again from My Very Organics, and happy gardening. Hi guys, thanks for joining us as our web team is working out the all of the kinks to make sure that we have a smooth running YouTube live experience on Saturday, June 16th at 8.05 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, where we're gonna be launching the best organic fertilizer on the market. We're gonna go through all the details on that during the live stream, again on this Saturday, June 16, 2018 at 8.05 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, and while we're running this test YouTube live stream, I'm actually live with you guys in the chat room. So if there's any questions, please feel free to write me. And I'd love to hear from you guys. Send a shout out, hello to me, hear from you. Let me know which city and state you're in, or if you're from other parts of the world, what country you're in. I'd love to know where you guys are um, tuning in from so we get a better idea of where our audience is located. Our channel has been growing so well Thanks to all of you guys. I really appreciate all of your support. And you're gonna be rewarded in turn with the things that we're gonna share with you this Saturday, June 16th, 2018 at 8.05 a.m. And again, so looking forward to seeing all of you guys right then and there. Talk to you soon.
Again, good morning, everybody. Um, this is a nice group, and we've been to many beautiful homes. This is obviously near the top of my list, and I'm sure you guys love being here as well. Um, I personally define this property as being called the Moroccan Garden of Eden. As you can see, it's got a lot of Moroccan theme-inspired um, concepts throughout the garden. Um, and it's loaded with nearly 100, if not more, maybe a little less, 100 fruit trees. Um, and Brad's going to get into it as he dis discusses disaster preparedness and making sure you've got food on your property. These garden clubs are really about you guys. Um, it's, I loved hearing some of the conversations between people introducing each other and meeting each other and learning where you guys are positioned within the community. And that, one, increases the safety of our community. Um, and two, it just makes this small community even smaller. Um, and it's been really fun doing these garden clubs for the last, I think it's been almost maybe three, if not four years now. Four times a year, every season, you can count on finding us somewhere within the community. I'm Brad Fickus, uh, the owner of this property and uh, uh, part of, uh, currently part of the HKCC uh, board and uh, on the garden club and also uh, with the neighborhood watch with the security committee. I just want to thank Brad for hosting. It's yeah, such a beautiful property. Thank you. Um, a quick inter introduction about myself, and then Brad will take the floor. I um, have a seat. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Hello. Um, so as you know, I'm Charles Malky. I'm, on, I'm one of the five um, co-chairs for the Garden Club. Um, Sandy Gitmid's on it, as well as um, Deborah Prasikian and, um, and then Jerry Baker, the, who's in Hawaii right now, returning, I think, today. Um, the five of us with Brad constitute the Garden Club Committee. And um, I just want to make you all aware, you may notice there's a few cameras here. I always um, share with you guys the fact that these Garden Club lectures are preserved forever um, on YouTube, where you can find it. Um, the Ivory Organics um, Garden Channel is now the number one garden channel of uh, being a garden product based YouTube channel ahead of miracle Grow, Dr. Earth, Espoma, Kellogg's, you name the garden products were in first place um, with a little over 20,000 subscribers and about four to 6,000 daily views watching about 160 videos on garden care. So we're going to be touching on more concepts and hopefully bringing more education um, to the gardening world. and and hopefully for you guys to apply and, and add to your gardens as well. And with that, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks. So over, over the uh, past uh, couple meetings, we've been, and actually into the past, we have talked about specifics, um, specifics in gardening. Um, it might be, uh, might be talking about citrus. It might be talking about uh, fertilizers. Um, but today, I'd like to talk about a topic called permaculture. And permaculture actually will cover so many of these topics. It's, it's the broad topic and these other topics fall under, underneath it. So how many of you have heard of the term permaculture before? Okay, a few of you. All right, um, permaculture, the, the, the uh, permaculture has actually been around for centuries, for, for thousands of years. The idea of permaculture, uh, of, of having, uh, of man interacting with plants and with, and with animals um, and working among them have been around for ages. And, uh, but only back in the 70s, in the late 70s, was that, uh, coined, uh, was that term coined. Uh, permaculture can be, it's, it's either, it's, it's either uh, called permanent agriculture or permanent culture. And the definition, the definition of permaculture is a system of agricultural and social design principles centered around stimulating or directly utilizing the patterns and features observed in the natural ecosystem. So you can see that's, that's pretty broad spectrum. We have, without, even before I learned about this, I'd heard about permaculture, but even before studying it, I thought, you know, even here at my house, I've done things that have been, you know, I, kind of, I, I knew naturally that there were things that I wanted to do to follow those principles. Number one is we, all the water that comes off of our roof and comes off of the property here funnels into a drainage system that goes to a collection point. And that water can be reused. So that's, that's, part, of, that's part of permaculture. Another part of the permaculture is, um, I'm, I'm going to pass these around right now, but I have, uh, I have palm trees on the property that are decorative, but they're also, I can, I can eat the fruit off of them. So that's, um, I'm bringing the fruit, I'm bringing the food source closer in so that it's, uh, that 
I can actually pick off there. I can eat off of it. If you see over there, those, that hedge that I have growing, um, that sweet bay, I can use that. I can, I can take cuttings off of that, use it for cooking. Um, we have some, uh, in, and over there I've got a planter box. I'm just about ready to put lettuce. I had some fantastic lettuce this last year out of that planter box. That's right close to the house. So it's, it's what, what we're doing is we're utilizing, we're, we're um, making ourselves efficient here, the least amount of steps, the least, you know, of course, you think about it, all these farms are up in Central Valley, right? That's, you know, how much gas it takes to get the fruit down here to us. And yet we could do things within our own home, around our own home, to be able to bring food closer in and to be able to enjoy it. And it's, it's obviously more natural, less pesticides. But anyway, I'll, I'll pass this around. Sandy, you had one already. Yes. And you can smell it or you can take one however long they last. There's a seed in the middle, I'll warn you. Um, but it's, but these are, it's called, it's called a uh, Budia capitata or pindo palm. And they're from Argentina. And it tastes a little like candy, the, the, the fruit. But the point is, I'm using, I'm using an example here. This is something that's decorative, but I can also, um, so I can plant around the house, but it's a food source. It's very close to me. So the theory, the theory behind permaculture, now you understand really the definition is, is it, it's the philosophy of working with rather than against nature with thoughtful observation versus thoughtless labor and in incorporating the functions of humans, animals, and plants as one rather than tr treating them separately. So the whole process is, is that we're including, we're including nature, we're including domestic animals, and of course if you're a vegan, it would just be the, it would just be the plants. Um, you're incorporating all of that into, into your life. Um, so it's, it's uh, you know, and, and I'll talk in a little bit, I'll, I'll talk about, uh, I've got a worm composting bin here, and I've been composting for a long time, but it's all part of, you know, people talk about the cycle of life, talk about recycling. That's really all part of, of permaculture. So um, in practice, um, all of us as responsible residents of the earth should design and plan our lives and surroundings in a way that we can efficiently incorporate our food source closer to us in a non-toxic manner. Permaculture can be practiced to any level that is practical for the individual. So what, a, what, what I'm trying to say is this, is that you can take permaculture to an extreme or you can just, you can just incorporate a few of the principles. It's just, it's a matter of, 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 of to your lifestyle, you know, thinking about it, thinking about what's, what's practical and what's suitable for you. And that's, um, and, and that's the point that I'm making, is that you can take as little or as much of it as you want. Okay, so it's so in here, and this is not everybody can do this, um, but they have uh, they have uh, rainwater harvesting uh, planters and and barrels. Um, they have an area where they have four square vegetable and perennial gardens. I mean, gardens can be around here. We want to use uh, raised bed gardens in, in in most cases because we have bad many times we have bad soil. It doesn't drain well. Um, we have by raising by using raised bed we can we have more control over them. we can put uh, we can put mesh underneath to prevent the gophers from coming in um, we can actually mix our own soil so in in this particular design they have they have square planting areas they also have what's called a healing garden so you can people can go in there and we'll talk a little bit in a, in a little bit about healing um, uh, healing medicinal herbs and, and plants uh, they have a wildlife focal point they have a uh, they have beehives. Now I don't know right now what the laws are on beehives, but I do have some empty bee boxes back there, and I'm going to check the laws. And if I can do it, I will. Um, what's that? Oh, good. Okay. Well, I'll pull them out. Um, and uh, one thing that I'm starting on is uh, is raising quail because the eggs they're very efficient. They actually take less food than chickens do per egg, and they and they actually mature a lot quicker too. And the egg tastes about the same, but they're 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 a smaller egg. So that to me is, those are, these, are, these are principles um, that are, you know, th that's the idea of permaculture is being able to um, have your food source around you as much as you can. It could be as little as, uh, as having areas right by your back door where you're growing herbs or where you might have, um, you, you know, you may have uh, some quail or chickens. Bees are a, um, you know, that's a whole different world and getting into and, and you have to be prepared for it and your neighbors may not like it. So um, anyway, I just wanted to, you know, this is, this is the, that's, that's being passed around. This gives you an idea of a house that's well designed with permaculture in mind.
Okay, so the um, so we'll get into the the uh, court, and I'll, I'll go through it real quickly because I don't. You can always study it online. Um, there's the core tenets and principles of design, and that is uh, care for the earth, which is provision for all life systems to continue and, and multiply. This is the first principle because without a healthy earth, humans uh, cannot flourish. Charles will later talk about the underground jungle, and that also ties right into this permaculture and to, into, a, into a healthy earth. Care for the people. Uh, provision for people to access those resources necessary for their existence. This is another core tenet of, of uh, permaculture. Setting limits to population and consumption. By governing our own needs, and of course you may or may have not have your own opinion on, on um, controlling the population. Um, in some countries we know that the population is actually falling on its own. Um, we set resources aside to, to further the above principles. This includes returning waste back into the system. Um, and, and to recycle its usefulness. And then we'll talk, we'll talk a little bit about that with the, with the uh, worm composting. The third ethic is sometimes referred to as fair share, which reflects that each of us should take no more than we need and reinvest the surplus. So it's, it's really what it comes down to is living responsibly. Okay? One, one example of that would be um, worm composting. Now, we've, I talked before a number of uh, meetings back, I spoke about composting. Composting is still, a good, is still a good principle, but the idea behind worm casting is, uh, worm castings or, or worm composting is that it's actually a much quicker cycle. Now, I'll, I'll pass this around. I'm going to start over on this side at this point. There are what are called, the, there's a special type of worm, and you can see them. They're called red crawlers, red. And, the, and, they're, and they're efficient. I think last time, one time you mentioned about uh, worm composting. Um, you can actually, from um, once, if, if, you, if you're taking old newspapers, garden scraps, um, by keeping them wet and by turning them and by managing your worms, you can actually turn it into um, compost so much quicker than this is this this started out as with a little bit of soil, but this started out as newspapers, um, garden scraps, etc. The worms will will compost it much quicker than if it sits in a compost pile on its own. And the end result is you can you have this incredible compost that's real rich out of the garden scraps, out of the papers you've thrown away. Um, you can also get, because of the water washing through, there's a spigot at the bottom here, you can get, uh, you can get wor uh, worm compost tea, worm casting tea. Um, that can be actually sprayed onto uh, trees and it can be sprayed onto your shrubs as, as, as an insecticide in, in, at certain, in certain uh, strengths. That's it. There, there you have a natural insecticide as well. So I think this is a fantastic way to go. It doesn't take a whole lot of space and it's a... Um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's not real invasive. You can put it someplace off to the side and uh, you can just turn your, your kitchen scraps over real quickly. I mean, if you, have a lot of, if you have a lot of things to compost, this may not be the way to go. But with a little bit, you can get compost pretty quickly and you can get that warm compost tea that you can use to, to spray on your plants or to, to water your plants as well. And it's incredibly nutritious for the plants. So I just, you know, I, I feel very strongly about this and that's, and, and that's why I wanted to bring it up today. Red worms, uh, well, I could, I could probably give you some later on. That's, you know, it's, it's kind of like, like women sharing the bread yeast. I'll share some of my, my worms with you, okay? But you can, order, you can order them online and they can, they can ship them to you. But I've got some worms, I can share them with, you, with those of you that want them. And, um, is, you know, but, but it's a spe it's a spe they're called red crawlers. Um, so the next, the next topic would be the 12 design principles. And I'm just gonna run through them real quickly because um, it's, it's not something that we, really, that we really need to dig into today, but observe and interact. By taking the time to engage with nature, we can design um, solutions that suit our particular uh, situation. Catch and store energy. And again, it could be solar, it could be wind power. Um, by developing systems that, that collect resources at peak abundance, we can use them in time of need. Uh, obtain a yield. Ensure that you are, are truly using uh, the useful rewards as part of the work that you're doing. Apply self-regulation and accept feedback. We need to discourage inappropriate activity to make sure the systems can function as well. So it's just, it's, again, we, we're trying to avoid wastefulness. Uh, use and value renewable resources and services. Make the best use of nature's abundance to reduce the consumptive behavior and dependence on non-renewable uh, resources. So how, how many of you here are using, currently using solar energy, uh, have solar systems, or using wind? 
It's a, it's a big investment and in, very good. It's a big investment and um, quite honestly, uh, you know, someday I'd like to have possibly even a wind turbine here on the property. You know, it's, it's but, uh, but again, solar energy, you have those big panels. If you have a nice house, it may not look the best on it, but you know, it's something, it's something to consider. There's electric cars now, right? So that's, and, and you have a, you have solar? Oh, I'll send it my way. <laughs> they won't allow us to share. Oh. <laughs> and we have electric cars that then also get charged. Yeah, with I actually charge my electric car. Yeah. That see, that's fantastic, and it's and, and obviously it's it's you know it's uh, you, you don't have the pollution aspect of it, and it's it's so much more efficient. So these are that's all part of permaculture again. Um, integrate rather than segregate by putting the right things in the right place relationships develop between those things and they work together to support each other so that's that's a, that's another principle use small and slow uh, solutions small and slow uh, systems are easier to maintain than big ones and again here's a small here's a small solution um, use and value diversity uh, diversity diversity reduces vulnerability to a variety of threats and takes advantage of unique uh, nature of environment which which it resides quick example is um, you most of you know I'm in horticulture and that I work with trees um, there have been times like down at, in Irvine where they had one tree planted all the way down the parkway these bugs came in these borers they wiped all the trees out it just they, they lost all the trees rather than staggering and losing only a few trees that's the problem when you have when, when you have just a synonymous or just a single variety versus biodiversity biodiversity is healthy and it's and it's also more interesting so that's that's just a just a thought use edges and value the marginal the interface between things which is the most interesting events take place this is often the most valuable and diverse uh, uh, productive elements in the system creatively and use uh, creatively use and respond to change um, I'm sure everybody's read that book, Who Moved My Cheese? You know, it's, it's, it's always, uh, it's, you know, when something comes along and it's different, try it out. See if it, see if it works for you. Give it a chance. Embrace it. So that's, that is, those are the principles of, of permaculture. So I hope you've enjoyed that information on permaculture as well as other related topics. And now we're going to watch an educational moment called The Underground Jungle. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. And most importantly, don't forget to join us live on Saturday, June 16th at 8.05 a.m. Pacific Standard Time as again, we're based out of Los Angeles, California, where we're going to be launching our new product, an organic fertilizer that is unlike any other fertilizer on your shelf and designed to offer your plants everything that they need to help make this your best growing season ever. Again, don't miss us. This particular recording is a test live stream in preparation as our YouTube professionals are working behind the scenes to make sure that your experience on Saturday, June 16th, 2018 is tops. And again, want to thank you all for your support and looking forward to seeing you all there on the first and most important Ivory Organics YouTube live launch date. Again, being June 16th, 2018 at 8.05 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So looking forward to seeing you all there and wishing you all the best, happy, growing gardening season ever. Take care. The underground jungle. Um, we're always looking at what's happening above the ground, but there's a thousand times more happening below. And I've been just watching in my garden. And if you view those YouTube videos that I'm telling you about, there's 160 of them. And the majority of them, about 80 or 90% were done in my backyard. Um, over the course of the last two years. And you can see how fast my, my property has matured. All of my trees are less than three years old. And I've got some bananas measuring 20, 25 feet, you know, and I'm picking 60 pounds of bananas two to three times a year. Um, you know, and I've got my avocados, my pomegranates, I've got, um, you name it, loquats, 10 citrus trees. Um, there's about, about 30 trees, three different olive varieties on one tree five different fig varieties on one tree. Um, and these are just like some skills that you can acquire and develop and, 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 add, and bring to your home. With the underground jungle, life begins at the leaf. It starts above the ground. And um, the concept of the underground jungle I wanna to give to the California rare fruit growers. Uh, it was a meeting I just attended last weekend, so I'm bringing it to you today. Um, 
with the leaf, what's happening at the end of the leaf, and I'll have you guys, I want to make this a little bit more interactive. Um, what are the leaves doing for the plants? Any thoughts? Yeah, so they're making the carbohydrates and the sugars for the plants. Anything else the, the leaf is doing? They're, they're capturing carbon dioxide. So they're con you know, um, converting the carbon dioxide into oxygen and making the sugars. Uh, any other um, elements the plant's making as well through that leaf? Thoughts? When they fall, they turn into fertilizer. So when they fall, it turns into you know, your, your compost, which ultimately feeds the soil. Um, so the other things, too, think about, like for example, your avocado's got a lot of fat in it. Where is it coming from? It's the leaf. The vitamins that are in your, whether it's in the leaf or in the fruits or the flowers, all of that's coming from the leaf. Like the leaf is the source of all of the good things that are in your plants. What's happening now is from the leaf, any excess goes into stems, from the stems into the branches, from the branches down the trunk, and from the trunk down to the roots. Once it gets down to the roots, that's where life begins underground. Um, the example that was given last week is, you know, imagine the little piglets, you know, when you put food out and how they all like come screaming and, and, and you know, and racing to the food and, and consuming it as fast as possible. What the tree is doing is it's putting all of these, not just sugars, but life-giving things that the soil depends on is coming off of that root and now feeding the soil biology. Um, now, let's talk about what organisms live under the ground. We got a lesson on one thing, but there's more things in your soil than just worms. Any other ideas? Gophers. Gophers. <laughs> Minerals. Minerals, but living things. What living things are under the ground? Bacteria. Bacteria. More insects. Mitochondria is inside the cell. What else? Bugs, worms, ants. So, um, so just generally, um, so you're going to see the worms, you're going to get the bacteria, you're going to get the fungus, you're going to get the, um, all the other insects that may exist under the ground. It could be the slugs and the snails and the, um, the roly polies, saw bugs, um, springtails. You guys know what springtails are? So sometimes you might water around your trees if you've got good compost, and you'll sometimes notice these little white things like jumping around. Like, you know, it's typically under a well-composted tree. You'll see these springtails. But something hard to catch with the naked eye, but they're there. Um, and they're there by the thousands. So there's a lot of organisms. Now, what value does the earthworm bring to the soil? And Brad touched upon it. What does it do for your plants? Like, what's so good about the earthworm? Aerate. Aerates the soil. Anything else? The elements. So what the earthworms are doing is they're, if you saw when he opened this, there's a lot of leaves and a lot of, you know, his kitchen scraps are in here and that's feeding the worms. What the worms are doing is they're eating all of these, all of this life, but all the things that are in it, like for example, if there's lemon peel in there, a banana peel in there, the leaves that are in there, all of these things have elements off the periodic chart that went into creating these things. The worms are eating it and turning it into manure, which is more readily available to now the plants. So all of those elements are now ready to go into the plants. But there's something really special the earthworm is doing in the ground, and that is the in science and biology have you know, researched and found that there's something in the manure of worms called chitinase, which is an enzyme that breaks down chitin, which is the main ingredient in making the exoskeleton of a lot of the pests, including like aphids and, um, and other you know, sucking and chewing insects. Even grasshoppers um, would hate to get chitinase on them because it would dissolve their, 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 their body skeleton. So if they're um, consuming a plant that's got these chitinase enzymes in it, it's going to serve as a natural repellent to the aphids, a natural repellent to the grasshopper, a natural repellent to these other pests to say, hey, leave me alone. All because this plant is standing on a ground full of earthworms. So the earthworms are offering the plants now natural defense. If you're now adding a chemical fertilizer to the soil, and we're going to talk about chemical versus organic in a second, but if you're adding a chemical fertilizer to the soil that's not feeding the soil biology, then you're going to get an unnatural amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium that's going to create artificial growth, and it's going to grow without the defenses and the protections that otherwise would be gained by feeding the soil biology and really building the plant from the root up. That's when you'll see your plant being attacked by the aphids and it's uncontrollable and, and, and it's being you know, um, just fed upon by all of the pests that exist in your garden. But for the maximum defenses, you're gonna want a really good soil 
biology and diversity, and it's far greater than just the worm. Um, the worm, if I were to take a teaspoon of soil out of my garden and say, how many worms do I got in here? Any guesses how many there would be? Like three? Thoughts? None. Zero? There should be zero. I mean, in a teaspoon, chances are it's, gonna be, it's not, it's not going to be there. It's got to be measured over an acre or, or a, at least a few, few feet at least. Um, but the point is, it's, I wrote maybe one. But the value of mushrooms or mycorrhizal fungus, um, in a teaspoon now, how many mycorrhizal fungus, which it, when I say mycorrhizal, it's just fungus in general, the mushrooms, um, how many of those roots, also known as hyphae, would be in my one teaspoon of soil? Any guesses? A dozen? A dozen? A hundred? Millions. Millions in a teaspoon. Millions of fungus. Um, again, if you're doing things organically, there'll be millions of fungus. and um, and we're going to get to that in a second. Um, actually, I'm going to start with this. This here is my publication I did at midnight um, tonight. It's the first time I ever used my seven-year-old Isabel's um, artwork on my, <laughs> on my business. Um, but I'll pass this around. But uh, what I'll share with you, what's in here. So what, what that picture shows is a banana tree and an apple tree. They're a distance apart. The roots are not touching one another. But what's happening in between is there's this mycorrhizal fungus. The roots of the mushrooms. The roots of the mushrooms, um, you don't necessarily have to see the fruiting body of the mushroom. If you see the mushroom in your garden, that means it's, I just said it, it's fruiting. It's creating the spores to create more mushrooms. But the, the system is really underground, and it's thriving on the roots of your trees that's offering the sugars to the fungus. And then what the fungus is doing in turn is it's now balancing and networking your entire backyard. One mushroom and those roots, or those hyphae, can travel as far as a thousand feet. So imagine how many trees within your property can be networked from just one mushroom system. So it's, it's really phenomenal and amazing. And what it does is it balances the water within your property. It balances the minerals between the plants. It also helps plants uptake a lot of elements they otherwise can't draw out of the soil on its own. The mushrooms help bring it. Um, it kind of also helps me understand, like, for example, when you see a oak tree sitting on the top of a hill and there's no other life up on that hill and it's somehow living on its own, more likely than not what it's done, because 95% of plants, if not 98% of plants, are dependent upon the system with the mushrooms. Um, but it's a way that the trees at the highest, driest parts of the hill can draw water is through its relationship with these mushrooms. They can grab the water, bring the water up to the tree and exchange the trees giving some sugar and life to the mushroom because it's living under the ground. So it's, it, it's that symbiotic relationship that exists. Um, so now mushrooms. Even more, than, even more than mushrooms now, in my teaspoon of soil in my backyard, how much bacteria can I expect in that? Maybe. Guess? Millions? More than millions. <laughs> now we're in the billions. Um, so now imagine like in this compost bin, even though you see the worms, there's so much more life happening with the bacteria. Like, don't ignore the bacteria as well. Um, and what's happening again with all of these systems is they're adding waste into your garden naturally, which is ultimately feeding and making your trees the healthiest they can possibly be. Um, the other cool thing, and I did a video on this as well, is talking about the power of antibiotics by doing things naturally in your garden. Um, how was antibiotics discovered? Mr. Fleming, what was it? that ultimately killed the bad bacteria in his petri dishes. Any guesses? Where did the antibiotics come from? Like the whole idea and the concept. Penicillin. Yeah, the penicillin was, was, was what Fleming came? Mold. Mold. So historically, if you research this, and I've never done it, and I don't recommend you do it, but historically they said they would take moldy bread and put it on your infection. If you have a cut or a scrape or anything, moldy bread, and, and they knew that that would control bad bacteria from happening at the side of, uh, at the side of a cut or, or an infection. Um, so that was discovered off of a mold or, or a fungus. There's good bacteria and there's good fungus that naturally release these antibiotic chemicals into the soil. And now, for example, by mulching and adding good compost around your plants, it'll combat now the bad diseases that can contribute towards root rot and stem rot and all these other bad things within your soil by having so that's basically... The from. That's... That's what just go plant a bunch of mushrooms. they're already there. If you're doing if you're doing things if you're doing things natural, they're there. Um, so antibiotics, um, the percent of healthy soil. Um, I know when we go to planting a plant, they typically want to do like 50% native soil with 50% 
compost. But again, another lesson I, I gained this year is that healthy soil is really 50% air and 50% water. And then the other 50% is just your dirt, the minerals, your clay, your sand, your silt, and depending on where you live, it's, the percentages are different. But it's really about 5% out of that entire pie chart that I just gave that is your organic matter. And all you really need to do is just care for the surface of the soil. About 80 to 90% of the root systems of all of your plants are in the top 18 inches of soil. So I mean, imagine with all of this that you see, the top 18 inches is where about 80 to 90% of its life is. Those roots near the surface are breathing. Some of them are going a little deeper for structure. Um, I know in one of the lessons they said the deepest, like for example, some of these oak trees would go is maybe eight or 10 feet with a tap root. But again, the majority of the roots that are supporting and, and providing the nutrients and the health of the plant are on the top 18 inches. So by just caring for that surface soil with a good layer of compost and mulching around it and watching the mulch break down and, and repeating the system once or twice a year, that's going to feed all of that soil biology. It's going to bring the worms to the surface that are then going to go and aerate the lower parts of the soil and create a nice, you know, diverse ecosystem around the plant. Do you have to break up the hard clay first? Um, when you initially plant a plant, yes. Um, you, no, what, the, what most research will support is that you should not disturb the surface of the soil almost at all. Um, when I do fertilize my plants, which I don't know if we're touching upon fertilizer in this lecture, but um, it's typically spring, summer, and fall that you'll feed your plants. And then in the winter, you basically take a break, aside from maybe a foliar feed for some trees, such as citrus and, and tropical plants that can benefit from a foliar feed, typically December, January. Um, but other than that, as I'm gonna give credit to Tom Spellman, both of us were in that meeting. He's one of the representatives for Dave Wilson Nursery, which is one of the largest distributor of fruit trees in the country. And what Dave Wilson said is, when you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing you do? Aside from maybe brush your teeth, but when it comes to food, you have your breakfast, right? Um, but usually you don't have the biggest breakfast unless you're an IHOP, but um, typically it's, 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 a, it's like, you, for me, I gotta force myself to finish a bowl of cereal. Like, I'm not hungry, but I just do it because I don't wanna be hungry an hour later. Um, so you usually have a small, you know, a small start to your day. Um, your breakfast is the equivalent for the plant's life is spring. The plant's coming out of winter dormancy and even your evergreens, such as all, all the searches behind me, um, those are your, you know, they're green year round, but they still also go into dormancy. The growth slows down tremendously in the winter months compared to spring, summer, and fall. So in the spring, you're gonna feed it lightly. In the summer, you're gonna feed it the most, like follow the directions and you can give it like the maximum amount. Come fall, you're supposed to cut back again. You're going now into your dinner for your day. And then at night, which is winter, you don't feed your plants. You don't want them growing when they're supposed to be resting. So that's kind of like the, the, the pattern for the plant. Um, that kind of concludes my talk, and I think I went a little bit too much, but I'm going to have um, Brad go, and then um, I'll be concluding on another topic shortly. So thank you all. Thank you. Okay. So I hope you guys are enjoying this new video content, which was recorded earlier, educating you on emergency preparation and permaculture and improving soil. All of this is being done while our YouTube professional editing team is working behind the scenes, removing all the kinks to make sure that this Saturday morning at 8.05 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on June 16, 2018, we're gonna be launching our newest product line, which is an organic fertilizer, unlike anything that exists on your garden shelf today. You're gonna be really excited. Make sure you set your alarms, again, for 8.05 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. We're based here out of Los Angeles, California, and you're gonna to get to learn what makes an organic fertilizer great. And we have an excellent product, and in fact, we have two product lines we're gonna be sharing, both our super as well as our premium blend fertilizers, and we're gonna go into all the details on that live on Saturday, June 16, 2018 at 8.05 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So while you guys are watching this, I'm with you guys live, behind the scenes, in the chat room, answering questions. If you don't have a question for me, please take a second, just say hello, include your city and state so I have an idea of where you guys are from, and I'm gonna to respond to all of those um, as fast as I can while we're all watching this educational moment brought to you by Ivory Organics. And again, this is just a test 
live launch in preparation for this weekend's most important live launch, new product launch date. And we have so much to share with you right then and there, so be sure not to miss it. Starting sharp at 8.05 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. For those of you that haven't done so already, make sure you push on that alarm notification next to your subscribe button to make sure that you get that bell reminder of when we're in fact live. So that'll be another way to make sure you don't miss this very important event brought to you by the Ivory Organics team. Thanks again for watching and let's continue on with the video. The next talk is gonna be on medicinal herbs and plants. And um, you know, the idea of medicinal herbs and plants is not new. It's been around for hundreds, thousands of years and it's been used before penicillin um, they had to obviously people had to have a way to heal themselves and, and keep you know without really it, you know without really thinking about it, it got passed on by from one generation to the other you know uh, grandmothers passed it on to their uh, to their grandchildren and, and to their own children and um, so the herbs were just like if we were talking about part of permaculture um, were planted around the house and and were used when when things came up in fact um, my uh, my wife, who is from Morocco, has what, what what's called lemon verbena, and she uses that it, in Morocco. They always use it as a remedy for if somebody was jittery, couldn't sleep. Um, it was used as an expectorant, um, and so that's a prime example of of how um, of, of how an, an herb would be used. Now the thing about the thing about medicinal herbs is they can't they really can't call them that in the stores because of the you know the the, the laws that affect packaging and. Um, and I will tell you that each, everybody has different body chemistry and they react differently to these herbs. So when I'm pointing these, when I'm going to pass, I'm going to pass these around, talk about each one briefly. Um, but they have different qualities. Uh, some people will find that, uh, some of these herbs will help calm them down. Other people in a, and again, it could be a tea, it could be an essential oil. Other people might, uh, get anxious or might have other side effects, gas, that sort of thing. Um, for some people, like if they're using comfrey, too much of it, it becomes toxic within the body and it's not supposed to be used internally. So with, with that, as far as before I start talking about these, about these um, medicinal herbs, I just, wanna warn, I just want you to do, make sure that you do your study, um, due diligence online first to see if it's, if it's right for you. Because some of them, if you're taking a medication, might, it might react in, uh, in, in, a, in a way that's unfavorable. So. Um, that is that that's what i'd like to talk to you and and some herbs some of these medicinal herbs are not as effective as others i'm going to save the most effective one the one that i absolutely love for the last but uh but anyway we'll start talking about um this is called it's called artemisia it's called wormwood now wormwood is some people they believe um it's actually that, that they believe it's a it's a parasitic cleaner um some people have used it really as as a um as a treatment for cancer as well um, it's called Artemisia, and I'll go ahead and pass this around. You can, all of these, you can smell it. It's it's a little bit strong, um, but you know, all of these are. I've I've actually planted in my garden before and, and used them, and they're all basic. They're readily available, so you know, each of them has their own uh, has their own uh, uh, qualities and properties, and can be used for different things. And again, some people respond well to it. Some people don't. Okay. Next one is I as I mentioned is comfrey. Now comfrey. Um, is a, it's been used, it can be used for cattle feed, it's, it can be used as a green manure, which means it can be composted into the ground to enrich, uh, enrich the soil. And um, they found that when you plant it around other plants as a companion plant, it puts a lot of, a, a lot of nutrients back into the soil, kind of like legumes do. Um, but if you eat, if you actually ingest this, this can actually cause problems uh, in, in some cases if you ingest too much of it. What it's best for and what they've used it for for centuries is they basically mash it into a pulp, into a cell that they put onto inflammation on the, on the wounds. That has been effective. Um, so this is more of a herb that you would use uh, externally on, um, on a, uh, a wound or, or on an inflammation, a swollen joint, a sprain, that sort of thing. And again, it's, it's, these are... Um, this is all part of the permaculture idea of being able to interact with and, and, and stay away from chemicals and toxic, uh, toxic items. This is valerian. Now, valerian is considered a psychotropic. Uh, uh, it's, 
it is uh, a sedative, it can be considered a sedative, but it also can be toxic to some people, but it's, it, it can be taken, uh, can be uh, extracted as an oil or it can be eaten, but again, it comes with a warning. It's called valerian. Okay. Um, next one is lemon balm. Um, it's actually an antibacterial. Um, it's good for diabetes. It's an anti-inflammatory. And I, I encourage each of you uh, to, to smell these uh, also because some of these do have a, have a nice smell to them. Now here's, uh, here's a medicinal herb that is good for animals. And you'll know which one when I tell you what, what, what it's called. But it's also good for anxiety. It's, it's also, when I say good, again, I go back to, for some people, it's effective. Stress, lack of sleep. It can be brewed into a tea. Um, you can pull the essential oils out also. Catnip. Catnip. So again, cats like it. People benefit from it. And there's a couple different varieties of, of catnip. Now this is one, have, how, many, uh, how many of you know about stevia? Stevia comes in a packet, right? It also grows. I've got some in the garden. So you guys can take a, you can take a little piece off of it, a little bite, and... Uh, And, it's, and it'll, it, it'll be sort of a bittersweet uh, flavor. Okay. So in, and that was kind of a, that was a revelation for me. I mean, a, a couple months back, I didn't know you could just buy stevia at the nursery and um, be able to plant it in your garden and use it. But, you know, it's not, it's not bad. Um, this is called... Uh, uh, it can be called Mexican tarragon. It's called uh, me, uh, marigold Mexican mint, and uh, the the Mexican mint is known as a it's a companion plant. It can be planted it, it, just like the other tajetis or the other marigolds. You can plant it to chase pests out of the garden. Um, it's also considered an anti-inflammatory. It's considered a uh, it, it can it can be also considered as a relaxant. Um, and uh, it, can be, it can be eaten, it can be used in seasoning, in foods. It has sort of an anise flavor to it. Um, I, suggest you, uh, I suggest you take leaves off there, you know, uh, take a leaf off and you can taste it if you want or just smell it. And uh, this is, this actually has, uh, tell me what you think it is, Tom. Crush, crush a leaf. Pretty nice, isn't it? So lemon thyme, yeah. Thyme's and and the thyme is 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 very nutritious. Also, it's it's uh, it's very good for you. And the last tree or the last plant, which is it's not really an herb, but it's my favorite. It's called moringa. How many of you have heard of moringa? Moringa is a superfood. It's it actually has. Um, this is grown, it was, it uh, originally came from India and, and Nepal. Um, it actually has so much, so much nutrition in the leaves that it can be used as a, in, in nations where they have trouble getting food, like in Africa. Um, they can grow it, you can grow it as a large tree, you can grow it as a hedgerow. All parts of it are edible, the stems, uh, the leaves, the, the root. Um, it actually has a bowl of the fresh leaves, uh, from what I understand, has about as much protein as an egg. It has vitamins A, it has vitamin C, D, B6 in it. Um, I have a friend that has diabetes and he was using this. It actually lowered his blood, I, I suggested it to him. He claims it lowered his, his glucose levels, blood glucose levels. So it, it truly is a, um, a, miracle, uh, it's a, a miracle plant. Um, what I suggested in a meeting previously was that people could plant it as, as a uh, disaster preparedness um, uh, action, and you can live off the leaves. If it, let's say that we did, that you couldn't go to the grocery store, the, high, the whole idea is you want to be able to stay put, not move. 
if you have these growing, you have them as a hedgerow, you can actually eat the leaves and there's enough nutrition in there to survive. How do you commonly use it? Like you can use it, I, I drink it as a tea every morning. So it's, and, and I drink actually the, um, I drink the, the uh, bottom of it also, the sediment at the bottom, I drink all of that too to get the nutrition. You can use it in salads. You can cook, the um, Filipinos actually cook with it. They put it in stews. They cut it up and put it in stews. Do you dry the leaves for the tea? You can, yes, you do. And so it's, and, and, you, crush, and you crush it too so that, so that it has more surface area. But it's, um, it's incredible tea. I, I usually make my tea with fresh ginger, organic ginger. I put lemon in it too, and then I've got everything I need really to, and it has also, I, I failed to mention, it has the nine essential amino acids the body needs to, to um, develop immunity and to, um, and to function. So this is a, it's an incredible tree. I suggest everybody have, have one in their yard. That's why I say this is my favorite. Where do you get the trees? Um, you can get them at Home Depot. Has, is offering them right now. Um, so you can get them at Home Depot. It has, I'm actually growing them. I, I grow them from seed. But um, it's, uh, it is, to, to me, this is, this is the... Survival, this is the superfood also. Not only is it good for your health, um, for, for the vitamins that you need, the amino acids that you need, but also I've, I've been told that it will lower the blood glucose levels. So, moringa, and it's on your paper. Number eight, what full, full, full sun. This, is, this has been in the shade. That's the reason why leaves fell off the top of it. But they do well in the full sun. Um, they don't like it. When it, gets, when it gets too cold, they can't take the freezing um, temperature. But, but they, uh, otherwise, um, you know, they will do well here in Southern California. And you, <clears throat> this tree's probably um, about like seven months old. Oh. Yeah, it does, it, they grow pretty fast once they get started, so. Does, does it get really, can, it get really big? It can get up to 20 feet, you know, it, oh. it's a certain, and there's a couple of different species. I don't know if you said, it can also be pruned to a hedge as well. That's, that's what I mentioned yeah. earlier. So you can. If, if in, on farms, what they do is they plant them right next to each other and they keep <clears throat> shearing them off. And I had some planted, uh, I have some planted in a four by eight bed. You can actually do like an intense planting, an intensive planting. Um, it does flower and it does, the flowers are insignificant. It does have pods on them and they do use the pods also for, uh, the, for, for health purposes. How much water does it like? Um, you can actually, it's, the great thing about it too is it is a drought resistant plant. So you can cut back on the water, you know, and again, I, I'm not going to give you specifics because it all depends on the soil structure that it's planted in, but you can cut back on the water and you could, you know, in some cases, maybe every two weeks you could water it. So I hope you guys are all enjoying all of these lessons that were recorded earlier on permaculture, emergency preparation, soil enrichment, and so much more. This is all just a test live stream, again, in preparation as our media Professionals are working on removing all of the technical issues on the back end to make sure that the live stream, our first and most important live stream in Ivory Organics YouTube history, is going to be taking place again this Saturday at 8.05 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on June 16th, 2018. Hoping you guys can all be there so that you can find out what makes a fertilizer the best fertilizer in the world. Ivory Organics got it. We partnered and, and worked with close to a dozen different factories across the country to get you something you guys are going to want. And we're gonna offer that for sale starting this Saturday. And that you're not gonna wanna miss this event starting Saturday morning, again at 8.05 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on June 16th. So just a reminder again, I'm live with you guys in the chat room. Please take a second and say hello. If you have any questions i'm here to answer that but if you have none just let me know what city and state you're in i'd love to know where around the country and even around the world the ivory organics youtube channel has reached our products by the way do ship internationally we offer international shipping for as little as five dollars on orders over 50 so um that's something to consider for all of those international buyers out there so i'm looking forward to hearing from all of you guys right now just wave me a little hello in the in the chat room if you have nothing to say just would love to you know at least see you guys while I'm in there. And don't forget to join me again at the YouTube Live launch event where we're launching our world's best organic fertilizer. And we're gonna go into all the details as to why and what's the difference between our product and all the other products that are resting on your garden shelf nearest to you. Looking forward to seeing you all then and there. And thanks again for watching. This next talk's only gonna take a few minutes and then I'm gonna get the floor right back to you. Um, 
what I'm sharing with you next is the Ivory Organics product. And that's why I can do this in like two minutes because I have to do this all day long and I've really perfected doing this. But what I've <laughs> brought with me here is one avocado tree. And um, you want me to hold that up? No, take the Snapple bottle away, please. That's <laughs> that was my drink, but we'll hide it. Um, <clears throat> So what, we, um, so what we have here next to me is an avocado tree, but these lessons are applicable to everything. What is unique about the avocado tree is, um, I'm just going to say it, um, is a lot of this trunk is exposed. And for a normal tree, this would have a beautiful canopy one day in its future, and it's going to shade the lower tree trunks and branches. Um, but when it's young, like this, and in nature, typically it would fall between some other trees, and it would get itself started before, you know, one of the older trees maybe, you know, topples over or, or dies, and then this one would be there in place. But when it's young like this, a lot of trees are susceptible to the extremes. Um, the first thing I'm going to have you open before um, I explain the products is the way the products work. If you open the leaflet um, to the brochure. These are the three banners that we typically have at our booth um, to basically talk about the three benefits of the products. The first one being sunburn, sun scald, talks about premature blooms, and then anti-transparent. And let me explain this um, real, um, to you real quick. Um, firstly, have any of you heard about painting trees ever? Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. From you. From me. Yeah. You're right. I've been talking about this for about a year with you guys. Um, so some good students here. So the idea of painting your trees, and again, I've perfected this with all these talks, is um, for those that are painting their trees right now in their orchards, and I got a call just a few weeks ago from an almond grower outside of Fresno. So I had this going with me into this Reno convention where they're using organic fertilizers for their trees, they're using organic pesticides for their plants, but they're using chemical paint on their tree trunks. And if you um, do some research with your yellow handout, all of, most of these universities, I don't want to say all of them, but most of them when they talk about the benefits of painting your plants, will then say, now go to your paint department and you can go and find an interior latex based paint and avoid the exterior latex paint because it's got more chemicals in it than the interior chemical based paint. But all of them are one, carcinogenic, and two, they have algicides and fungicides. And algicides are in the plant family, so you know, applying it to your plant you know, could potentially be harmful to the plant. Um, but at the end of the day, paint's designed to last for decades. Hopefully, one application and you're done for the next century, if you're, you know, if you're me. But um, the bark on your plant, on average, changes itself about once every year or every other year at latest. Just like the skin on your hand is changing its skin about every month or two, the bark on your, on, on your trees is changing itself every year or two. So if you're putting paint on it, that's going to be a process you're going to have to do again every year or two, and all that paint's going to end up in your soil and stay there forever. Um, so that was kind of the, the birth and the concept and the idea behind doing things organically. When you take a look at the Ivory Organics products, I can read the inert ingredients to you. Iron oxide controls the color, but then limestone is the tradi traditional historical way of just taking limestone and mixing it with water and applying it to your plants. But once it gets wet a few times, it typically washes off. There's, then it goes on to the next ingredient, mica. Mica is clay. You can also do it with clay, but clay won't also last as long. And there's orchards now across America that are using clay as a anti-insect protection to plants as well, as it smothers and minimizes places for insects to, you know, to, you know, to live and, 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 and to endure. Um, milk and silica combine those inert ingredients, create a bond that then will last on your plant for about a year. And then depending on your conditions, it could be more than a year or less than a year, but it's in line with how long that bark's gonna last on the plants as well. So what you would do is you would take your can, which comes with, I got this lid ready, but what's gonna be here is the organic base powder, like this. So all those ingredients I just read are here. And then the magic is really here in this oil vial, which is bubble wrap. And I'm gonna pass the oil vial around because this is actually a little fun. Um, let me get that off. And that's fun too, popping the bubble wrap. Um, but the oils that are in here, if I can pass this to you, David, and I'll read it to you what's in there. 
The oil includes castor oil, cinnamon, clove, garlic, peppermint, rosemary, and spearmint. So when you smell it, it kind of smells like you're in the kitchen with all organic oils. And, um, and what the castor oil is doing, and I don't know if any of you here have any issues with rodents chewing on your tree trunks. None of you? I just found three trees that were behind my wall that are in container that I was going to use that were all chewed up over here. I've lost um, at least two trees to where a, um, it could have been a mole or a vole or any other critter that was just basically, and it's typically a winter phenomenon. When the, when the critters are most hungry, they'll then start chewing on the bark to get to the sugars and the sap, and they'll start damaging it. So the castor oil, the first oil in the product is there to offer that defense against the critters, but also the mints that are inside the product are also a natural rodent repellent. And then also the other oils, the garlic, the cinnamon, the cloves, all of that stuff, anti-insect. What you can then do with the product is you can take a teaspoon of it and put it in a spray bottle like this, and now you've got something you can now use as a foliar spray. So now you've got a product that can, as we read on the brochure, be used as a protection for the summer extremes. Um, even though we've got a beautiful morning today, do you guys know how hot it's going to be tomorrow? Yeah. 100 degrees. But with a 100 degree temperature tomorrow, you can imagine the benefits of spraying the plant to keep it cooler from the summer extremes. But the lesson today is about preparing your plants now for the fall and winter. And so with that being said, by putting a coat of protection on your bark, one, you're going to protect it from girdling critters that live in our community. Um, two, it's going to help insulate the plant. There's people that can now grow more plants. I would say in the landscape we're standing in right now, at least 90, if not 98% of the plants here are non-native. And in all of our properties, my lemon trees are not native, my avocado tree is not native, my um, plum trees not native. We're growing a lot of things that are from other parts of the world, but we grow it because we want it. I dedicate about five to ten percent of my garden for the native um, um, plants to attract the natural wildlife that exists in the area, and that also maximizes on the pollinators that then pollinate my fruits and vegetables. So um, I do dedicate some part of my property to native plants and to you know the um, monarch butterfly being you know, one butterfly we're trying to preserve, but there's a lot more than just the monarch butterfly that we should be concerned about by just, in, you know, putting as much native within our properties between the other plants and, and vegetables that we prize. Um, so again, looking, the, sun, the sunburn protection, sun scald protection is the extremes of winter. Premature blooms, by being coated as well, you're insulating the plant and keeping it cooler. So when you get those fall, spring days in the winter, Sometimes you'll notice your plants are blooming and you're like, it's too soon to be blooming. Had it wait another two to three weeks, it would be blooming into spring where it's consistently warm and not blooming just because we had an abnormally warm winter week before it goes right back into you know, cooler nights and then drop the blooms. Um, so the product also works for that benefit as well. Um, the insect repellent is for pruned trees. I notice as you step out, and I meant to tell Brad yesterday um, or two days ago when we were together last, that on this um, the name escapes me right now. Jacaranda. The jacaranda tree. Um, you'll notice where my finger is, as well as over here where there's a pruned branch. Um, that could have been pruned a little bit closer because this is now all exposed dead wood. You'll notice that there's a lot of holes in it. Termites, beetles, and everything else entering it through that exposed limb, it can work its way into the heart of the tree. And then you sometimes you know, see these stories with the tree that toppled over and you look inside of it and it's hollow. It all happens from a pruned branch. The goal is by sealing the prune branch, it'll help prevent those beetles and termites from entering the tree and beginning to hollow out the center of the tree you know, over the course of its life. Um, so those are just um, other benefits. I also wrote on here your bulbs. If there's an issue with your bulbs you know, being planted and the underground critters eating it, um, again, there'd be protection in coating it before planting it. Um, the difference I want to share with you, all of the yellow labeled products have the seven natural garden oils in it. The newest, which is the blue label, is basically your oil-free product for people not looking necessarily for the pest control benefits. Um, you basically got an oil-free version. So for people that are looking for just an organic paint to apply to your plants, that's the whitewash formula and all the products come in colors white, brown, and green. Are there any questions on the product before I give Brad the floor and we conclude? So the issue with the pines are a lot of be beetles coming in. 
Um, but it's a lot of time, energy, and effort. So it depends on you know, how you use it. If you're going to use it more as a foliar spray, as a brush on, you get the best coat. You know, if you do two coats, it's even better because now you got layers of oils between the products and you're creating even a stronger barrier. So it depends on how far you go in, in, in the application within your garden. Well, I would say with the pine, uh, uh, if you have any pruning cuts like we were talking about earlier, or if there's any fissures in the trunk, uh, because pines are do will will get beetles and uh, and by if if you know of course it's going to be it's in a, the the bark is very furrowed on on many of the pines so it's hard and it would be expensive to coat the entire trunk but if you specifically have pruning cuts or any openings in the in in the bark that's I, I would there. apply it as a paste in in uh, on on the pine. Who's got the oil area. vial? Here. Are you guys done with it? Did everybody smell it? Yeah. Let me just put it away so that person gets a yeah. complete product. And that's it. Thank you all. Okay, Brad, the floor is yours. <laughs> okay, so I, I want to get a poll from, from, from you guys. You're welcome. This is, in, and I, I already know the answer. So take a, take a guess uh, at if we had a major earthquake, you know, if we had over like a, over a 7.9 or an 8.2, which very conceivably could happen. It could happen in five minutes from now. It could happen two weeks from now. Um, it's going to happen at some time. It's, it's just, it's, it's, we're due for one. So I want to tell me what you think, how long it will be b until city services are back on. And then I'm talking about water. Uh, I'm talking about electricity. Um, okay. Ch so chances are, chances are that the answer from the fire department is three weeks. Okay. So now, so imagine, imagine yourself in your house. Okay. Imagine, okay, do you even want to go out? Do you want to go out? Do you want to go to the supermarket? Do you want to go anyplace at this point in time with everything down? Uh, fires could be going on. People in the streets looting. You know, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about getting out in your car and driving through that? Looking for water, looking for food, um, all those things. And the reason why I'm painting this picture is because that's most likely what's going to happen in, in a major earthquake. You're going to be fighting other people for food, for water, and so that's how I want to set how, how I want to go ahead and set set the set the battleground for you right now. Um, at, at in the in the future, early 2018, we're we're scheduling a neighborhood watch meeting. I'm going to have a. Uh, a do you do you folks know about CERT? Have you heard about CERT before? It's a it's a commit. Um, it's basically an emergency preparedness program. There's training out there that's given by the fire department for for um, every citizen that is interested in joining. I encourage you to go to the LAFD website and join one of those classes. A lot of great information. Um, but those, the, 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 the important thing to remember is, is that you need to be prepared. And there are a lot of resources out there right now. And I suggest, that rather than wait, the reason why I didn't want you to wait for that, for that meeting because it could happen at any time. So I'm going to give you some basics here. We're going to talk a little bit about it, and, I'll, and I'll, I've got some uh, handouts that I'm, going to, that I'm going to give you as well. Um, the, the most important thing that the human body needs is water, right? And that's the one thing that you should really focus on getting on your property, an emergency source of water right away. Now, that fountain over there holds 360 gallons of water right now. If I had uh, purification, if I had drops, even bleach, uh, if, even if I had bleach, I could take that water, put a drop of, of the bleach in there, and it would, cl it would clean it up. But that's, that is a, a, a more of a, that's, that water doesn't have any kind of chlorine in it at this point in time. It does have a small pill that I use to, that, to, to take the algae out, but it's safe for, for animals, for, for fish, for birds. I could use that. I can't, I don't know if I can use the pool water. I don't know if I can or not. But this is the way to go. This is a 55 gallon drum. Um, you put it someplace that not everybody can, if they're walking on your property, could find it. I have it, I have mine, I have two of these and I have them hidden. And the idea behind it is this, is that if you, it comes with a kit and these can, and I'll tell you where you can get it. Um, and it has, it has also, a, a t it, it has a tool that you can open this up. You can pretty much put water in there and with these drops that come with the kit, with these pure, when you pour it in, it's good for at least five years, the water is. You don't even have to touch it for five years. So you can leave it alone for five years. It's probably good for up for 10 years, but you know, they, they five years for sure. And so 55 gallon uh, drum of water, about how many gallons, you know, how, how much water do you think a person needs a day, an average person? 
one one gallon is right. That's that's enough for for just the basic for for basic drinking and and um, preparation for food. And keep in mind also you're my, you're going to want to use this water per, to prepare food if if possible too. So think about it. You do the math. If you have a family of four and you need to survive for a month, you know four by thirty. That's that's again how many gallons that you're going to need. Okay, 120 gallons. So this is this would be good for. Um, for a family of two for a month, um, for four you would need two two drums. I have a family of four, so that's wh that's why I have it. So this is I strongly suggest everybody get a a a, a, a barrel like this. I'll give you a handout. That's no, it's plastic. It's easy to pick up, very lightweight, and it comes like I said, it comes with the kit. It comes with a with a sticker on there too, um, and I have handouts here from the from the company called SOS which was recommended by the fire department as far as going for emergency supplies, and I'll, I'll hand those out to you later. You add those drops? When you're putting the water in. When you store and that's it. You, leave you just it. drop it in there, you fill the water up, and you leave it like that for five for five years, and you can empty it out later. So from it's... garden hose or something? Yeah. Did yeah. you drink it straight from the Yeah. Land? Oh, yeah. And what it comes, you buy, is you buy a... Uh, this, is, this is basically a... What do they call it? Plastic. It's a, it's a pump. So it's a pump that just like you would, you, know, you would uh, like it, it kind of looks like a faucet almost, and that would act as your faucet to be able to draw the water out. And if, if worst case scenario, you could always tip it over a little bit and pour the water out too. Um, but this is important. Put it someplace outside. Don't put it someplace like in, in if your garage collapses and it's in your garage, mm -hmm. not good. I have mine outside and I have I have them pretty well hidden. So I do recommend this. Um, also, this is, these are like, if, how many people know about, have been in the military, know what MREs are? Okay. This, these, this is dry food. This food is good for 10 years. And there's packets in there. They've got um, chili, macaroni, teriyaki, and rice. Loaded baked potato. Sounds good, huh? Yum. Okay. Um, probably not as good as mom makes, right? But, uh, but anyway, it's dried out. You need water. Um, so not only do you have this, you can buy cans of food also. You can buy cans of food off the shelf, you know, whatever you like, uh, chili or um, hopefully better than that. But uh, yeah, mushroom soup or, but, but you still have to cook, right? So either you have an outdoor barbecue or you have a camping stove with plenty of propane or whatever gas that you need. That's important. Okay, that's important to have. So I'm just giving you right now, I'm just giving you the basics just so you can prepare yourself. There's more to follow in, in, the, in that meeting. Um, you want to have outside, you want to have a flashlight. Um, you want to have uh, right, by, right by your bed, you want to have a flashlight. And you want to have your sneakers right next to your bed. Because typically what happens during an earthquake, glass stuff falls down. Lights are out if it happens in the middle of the night. Um, you want to be able to put your slippers on and walk over and be able to walk over and not cut yourself up. Because then infections you could get an infection while you're waiting you know while you're waiting for medical care so um, it's good to have outside it's good to have the water and the food you don't want it in the house because the house could collapse or you couldn't maybe you won't get to it sneakers flashlight cash you want to have cash at home you know a couple thousand maybe if you can if you can afford to have that hidden someplace because that's you know that's going to be important so all those things you need to prepare also, you want to have an emergency kit in your car in case you're stranded someplace, you know, in the trunk. Water, some food, you know, sn uh, snack bars, because it's, you know, if, if the earthquake happens, it, when it happens, if you're someplace, if you're out, you want to be able to, you know, you want to be able to have supplies as well. A change of clothes, some socks, shoes, those sort of things. Um, so uh, dried food. Camp stove or, or barbecue outside, water. That's those. That's the basics. That's the basics. We can talk about uh, about others others later on. Here is, and I'm going to have each of you. I'm not going to pass them out. You can pick them up on the way out. Um, this is just a, it's a it's a bookmark, but it's uh, it it, ta it talks about the 12 steps to prepare water, food, first aid kit. I don't. I have a first aid kit also. Um, cash and important documents. Those are important. Um, um, hygiene items, um, if you take any kind of medication, um, maybe you want to have some soap outside to, to, so that you, that you can um, uh, take care of yourself. For your pet, you maybe, uh, you know, for your cat, food, uh, uh, dog food, tools, 
It's always good to have a screwdriver or um, a crowbar. I have an emergency quit, kit with a crowbar in case I have to pry something open or get to it. Um, radio, a battery-powered radio or one of those crank radios are good. Flashlight we talked about. Medications if you're, if you're taking any. Um, safety whistle and then clothing. Okay? This, is just, this is just a quick, you know, I mean, it's, it's so easy to, to forget certain things, but these are the things that you'll need if, if there's a disaster and you can't, and, and you can't move around in your house. Um, we have a evacuation checklist along the same lines, family photos, cash, credit cards. These are the things that you'll want to take with you. You know, it could be fire, earthquake. Um, talks up here about storing water, emergency water storage. This is a good, there's plenty of these here. Why don't you pick one up on the way out? Um, if you're a diabetic, this talks about if, uh, specifically what you'll want to think about if you're a diabetic that you'll need. Um, and, uh, you know, letter from the diabetes healthcare professionals with most recent medication regimen so that, that, that you can pick that up quickly. So it, it's a, there's, a, there's a nice list here um, for, for diabetics. Uh, and then here is the company that gave me all these handouts, thank you very much, SOS Survival Products. Um, they're out in Strathern and Van Nuys, and they are probably the closest well-stocked uh, uh, store and again I'm not getting anything off of this they, they were recommended by the fire department so um, you know it just they're just very convenient very helpful people and um, not that far away just right off the 405 freeway and uh, and so all of this is free for you to take when you're done here um, I suggest you take it with you and then they have upcoming class uh, schedules like they talk they have uh, the one thing is I'm an amateur radio operator, so I'm very big on radio communications, and I'm hoping eventually to have individuals throughout the uh, community that also have that I've given radios to, and, you know, we can communicate if there's ever a problem. So that's, that's 280 radio class. Uh, 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 facts about EMPs, you know what EMPs are, right? Electromagnetic pulse, if it was like a nuclear attack, which, God forbid. Um, outdoor survival workshop surviving an active shooter we know that that's that's come to light recently and that's not surviving as an uh, as an active shooter but surviving <laughs> an attack by one okay um, and then um, and then emergency preparedness training so you know just to clarify so anyway these these are available too and uh, it's they 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 sound like they're great classes to take and um, these are all resources and the, you know it's it's a great place to go and visit and check out um, I'm done with this. Does anybody have any questions regarding this? It's, it's in a, and again, we're hoping to cover this in, a, in maybe early 2018 with a much more comprehensive class and somebody that's cert tra uh, a CERT trainer that w um, has already committed to coming when, when we're available. But um, I want to thank you all for coming today. Uh, you're welcome here anytime to visit. And um, you know, I hope you learned something. And, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. It really has. For those that want to attract the monarch butterfly sphere property, um, plumeria, you know, another beautiful addition. There's tons of plants. What I'm asking for all of you guys to do is maybe take a can, take a plant. Um, I want to do a quick picture with all of you and then come back and take more plants and more information. But if I can get you guys to the fountain. My name is Charles Malky, biologist and plant expert with Ivory Organics, where we grow cool plants. And this week is the week that Ivory Organics is launching, launching its super and premium blend organic fertilizers. What makes the Ivory Organics super and premium blend fertilizers better than any other product on the market? I've got my list here. I'm just going to read off of it. I'm going to put it down on the screen as well to share with you to kind of give you a heads up to the live launch day of June 16th, which is Saturday, June 16th, 2018, at 8.05 a.m. We're going to be announcing and sharing a lot of 
what the benefits of the product are. We're going to share the product with you. And we're also going to give 20 free bags to the first contestants to accomplish a very simple task, which will be announced shortly after 8.05 a.m. on, again, that June 16, 2018. So again, what are the benefits of the Ivory Organic Super and Premium Blend Fertilizers? Firstly, it has all of the macronutrients plants need. What are those macronutrients? There's six of them. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, sulfur, and calcium. So six macronutrients. All of them are in this product. In addition to, secondly, this product has many micronutrients essential for plant health. Thirdly, it's an organic product. Fourth, made in the USA. Fifth, context, contents contain beneficial microorganisms, which include the beneficial bacteria as well as the beneficial mycorrhizal fungi. And lastly, the product can be used as a granular feed around your plants at the soil level, as well as it can be mixed with water to create a foliar nutritional spray. That's six, and there's even more benefits that we're gonna share with you by you guys tuning in live on Saturday, June 16th, 2018 at 8.05 a.m. We're here right now at the Americana in Glendale and there's a box store just around the corner we're gonna walk to. I wanna share with you with some of the typical products you can expect on, your, on most garden shelves throughout the country. So let's check that out. So a lot of you asked this question, what's the difference between organic versus chemical fertilizers? Does it truly matter? Um, the first thing I want to share with you is there's some cities across the country that are banning the use of chemical fertilizers, especially when it's too close to a lake or, or a body of water. Bear in mind, and there's a lot of research that substantiates this, that as much as 60 to 80 percent of chemical fertilizers end up running, leaching through the soil and end up in your gutters, your drains, lakes, streams, and ultimately the ocean. So imagine for every pound of fertilizer, about a half a pound to three quarters of that pound of fertilizer is leaching. It's not even doing anything in your garden. So consider the amount of waste that's happening. Secondly, using chemical fertilizers increases the salinity in the soil. Nobody wants salty soil that is damaging to most plants. And lastly, using chemical fertilizers not only does it not support the soil health biology, but it actually harms it. There's a lot of research to show that chemical fertilizers will harm the beneficial bacteria, the beneficial fungus that's in your soil, as well as all of the other supporting life that's within your soil. On the contrary, using an organic fertilizer, what you're gonna do is end up feeding the soil beneficial bacteria. You're gonna be feeding the beneficial mycorrhizal fungi. You're gonna be feeding the earthworms within the soil and ultimately supporting all of the soil life and by having more soil life you're going to end up having more organisms that are going to be returning more essential elements into the soil for maximum plant health. Let's get and check out the nearest box store so we can see a garden shelf so we can now start comparing these two products. Check this out. Follow me. So here we are now. I've identified two companies that um, are offering chemical solutions for fertilizing your plants, and then there's two organic options for fertilizing your plants. The first one over here, let's take a look. If you take a look here on the back, you can see that the um, as a chemical fertilizer, it's derived from ammonium sulfate, potassium phosphate, potassium chloride, urea, urea phosphate, boric acid, copper sulfate, iron EDTA, magnesium, and so forth. Also something else I want to put you out to is the macronutrients to make sure that they're all there. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and then these are some micro elements, boron, copper, iron, manganese, molybdenum, and zinc. I see that it's missing right off the bat. There's no mention of calcium, no mention of magnesium. I see manganese, no magnesium, which is another macronutrients. I don't see any sulfur. Um, so those are three macronutrients, nutrients that plants need in abundance that's not in this product. Um, and then if we take a look over here, here's another chemical option. And if you take a look at the derived from down here, polymer coated, again, chemical formulations, ammonium nitrate, ammonium phosphate, potassium sulfate, magnesium sulfate. I don't need to keep on reading. 
These are all chemically derived ways to get to nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, the NPKs. And then here's magnesium and sulfur, boron, copper, iron, manganese, molybdenum, and zinc. So there's a, you know, quite a few micronutrients, but what's missing on this list? Calcium. The, and we're going to be learning as you continue watching these Ivory Organics um, educational moment that calcium, and I'm going to share with you the university studies that substantiate that that's the number two most important macronutrients for plants, which are also lacking in this product as well. If we take a look here now um, at an organic option, and this one here is a, a, a 555, if we take a look here on the side, it's going to show you that it is derived from hydrolyzed feather meal, blood meal, bone meal, sulfate of potash and compost with 5% nitrogen, 5% phosphate or your phosphorus, and 5% soluble potash. So 555 for your NPK. Again, your NPK. But again, what happened to your calcium, your magnesium, and your sulfur? Three macronutrients that are missing. If we take a look at the, um, again, this is the same company. We can go up here. Here's another product. And again, I see that there's good tomatoes on here. And for those of you that grow tomatoes, you know the importance of making sure that you've got an organic fertilizer that has calcium to prevent and blossom rot. That's where the bottom of the tomato will start turning black. So if we take a look here at the um, at this particular product, if we turn it over, it's going to show nitrogen, 2%, phosphorus, 7%, potassium, 4%. So that's your NPK derived from feather meal, bone meal, sulfate of potash, but what happened to the other three macronutrients? Not mentioned. And again, here's another product made by the same company as well. Um, so there we just looked at two chemical fertilizers, two organic fertilizers. None of them offer plants all six macronutrients. And this was another interesting thing I want to share with you as well. If we take a look here, take a look at what percent of NPK is in here. So this is, we're looking at um, nitrogen, 0.02, phosphorus, 0 0.02, and potash, 0 0.02. If you take a look at the NPK numbers, I'm hoping you can really zoom in here and capture this. It's 0 0.02, 0 0.02, 0 0.02, 0 0.02, meaning that less than 1% of this entire product has any beneficial fertilizer for your plant. It's 99% water, 1% fertilizer, compared to a product like this that's got... 5%, 5%, 5%. And we're going to learn more about percentages. So at least you got 15% of the bag contents going towards NPK. This one over here, a 5, 4, 6. So 5% nitrogen, 4% phosphorus, and 6% potassium. So that would be um, you're getting more value and getting higher numbers. We're going to be talking about liquid feeds as the Ivory Organics. Super and premium blend fertilizers can be used both as a ground fertilizer as well as a nutritional foliar spray um, fertilizer as well. So we're going to discuss all of that um, in the upcoming video. So I hope you found this informative. One last thing I want to share with you before we get out of here. Um, let's take a look at, again, the backside of this product. We just read that the, it's derived from feather meal, bone meal, sulfate of potash. I hope you guys see the difference between the derived from on this organic product versus the chemical alternatives, which are derived from, let's put them side by side here. Uh, so if you take a look again, it's derived from, this is ammonium sulfate, potassium false, um, phosphate, potassium chloride. It sounds like you're in a chemistry lab, right? You, you, I'm hoping you, you see the difference versus feather meal, which are obviously composted down feathers. That's the meal, the bone meal is composted down bones. Um, and then sulfate of potash is just a mineral source. Um, so I hope you guys also um, can quickly learn to pick up your product, read the back of it, see where it's derived from, and know without even reading the fact that it says organic on the label, to know that it's an organic derived source because of the ingredients that are within it. So that's another educational point lesson I want to share with you all. So I hope you found all of this informative, and we're going to recap just outside of here. So let's get out. So now you've got a little bit of an introduction to the background of what the Ivory Organics Super and Premium Blend Fertilizers are going to be all about. Um, so be sure not to miss out on the live YouTube event on this Saturday, June 16, 2018, starting at 8.05 a.m. and 
20 of you will uh, have the opportunity and the contest rules will be announced shortly after 8.05 a.m. for an opportunity to win up to 20 free bags, complimentary bags, shipping included throughout the United States to those contestants that participate um, in that contest, again, with the rules being announced shortly after 8.05 a.m. Looking forward to seeing you all there on the YouTube live launch event. So just a reminder, when you hit that subscribe button down below, to also make sure you hit that bell push notification, which will let you know and remind you of the fact that we're going live on that Saturday morning. I hope you find all of these videos informative and educational. And if so, again, don't forget to give us that thumbs up. And we're hoping to be your partner in making this your best growing season ever. Thanks again from Ivory Organics and happy gardening.